It's great to be back after a while. Um, it's great to see a lot of new faces. So uh, some of the things that I'm going to have to I'm going to say I'm going to have to put in context for all of you. So starting off, let's I want to share some pictures. Uh, our whole family we have four kids, and back then we had nine grandchildren. I'll get to that in a minute. But uh, so our whole family was together over the Christmas holiday. We have uh, a daughter who lives in Puerto Rico. We have a daughter who lives in Alabama. Two of our sons live in Nashville. But anyway, so we were all together. We went on a hike. Diane didn't go, so she's not in the picture. But uh, <laughs> anyway, we went on a hike, and uh, it, it was pretty treacherous, actually. So uh, two of the guys kind of like were my bodyguards to keep me from falling into the river. But, uh, <laughs> but we, we had a great time. But anyway, so we just had our 10th grandchild. So uh, the next picture, got, got Grandpa holding the, new, the newborn, and then uh, a few weeks later, that's the picture of, her name is Virginia Wren Brown. And uh, so we're uh, super excited about having another grandchild and being able to help out Marcus and Hannah with the kids. So next slide is a big picture of a whole lot of people that you don't even know who they are. <laughs> but this is the, the group that met there in the Broward Church Building in Florida for the uh, annual missions conference. Had over 150 uh, people brought in from South America to, uh, to learn and study and work together for, uh, for a week. And so that's the group that was there. It was uh, great to be able to be there. Uh, I actually got to teach for the first time ever at this thing, and so uh, you'll be hearing a little bit more about that in a minute. The next slide is our group of churches that you guys here in Nashville for many years have supported. So uh, we, we support the churches in, in Colombia, in Venezuela, Ecuador, and in Peru. And so we got to get together, the next pick slide, we got together with all the people that came in from those countries uh, there were a couple of people from Venezuela, not the church leaders, because he doesn't have a visa. But uh, anyway, we did have some, some representatives, at least, from Venezuela. And the Knoxville Church has been historically connected with the church there in, in Venezuela. And so it was great. I mean, just we had a great time with uh, all the brothers and sisters that, that came in from South America. The next picture uh, on the far side. That's Franklin and Maria and their two children. He leads the church in Caracas, Venezuela. And uh, just last weekend, they went down to Valencia. And I've told you guys about this situation in Valencia where the guy is a, was a traditional church planting and they kind of got kicked out of the churches of Christ, the traditional church of Christ because of some doctrinal things. And so They've been connecting with us. So Franklin and Maria are actually, they are speaking there. Where they are is the garage of Cesar, the, the leader of that group. They converted their garage into a place for the church to meet. So uh, that's where they're meeting. And uh, they went down and they're going through the, stud, the Bible studies with the whole church just to make sure. And the plan is that in April, the, the whole congregation will officially kind of become part of our fellowship. So that's, that's ongoing, and those plans are, are happening. Super excited about that. Uh, the next picture, it, update on Tom Jones. For those of you who haven't been here before, uh, this isn't going to make any sense, but Tom, at the age of 75, moved to Tuscaloosa, Alabama to start a campus ministry. Yeah. And, uh, and unfortunately, he had some health issues, and was not able to stay there and had to uh, move to New Orleans where his daughter is and it's, that's where he is now. But anyway, before he left, the next picture, you know, he, he moved there, you know, cold turkey, didn't really know hardly anybody. And in the, the six months that he was there, this is the group of people that he had met that came out for a dinner. Uh, he left and, uh, he got to, uh, he you know, studied the Bible with several of them, just uh, 
you know, God moved and worked, and he's still continuing relationships with a number of those people. But the message he left them with is, I really loved it. He, he said, stay open. Stay open to what God is doing. Stay open to how God is working. And, and that was the, the message he wanted to communicate to them. And so we'll, we'll come back around to that again later. Uh, what I want to talk about today is a subject that is dear to my heart, the kingdom of God. And uh, Tom, the guy I was just talking about, and I wrote a series of books. I think the next picture, uh, not that one. Uh, I thought the books were there. Oh, thank you. So anyway, Tom and I wrote these three books about the kingdom of God. And if you want to know more about the kingdom, you could consult those books. Um, I'm going to share some things today, uh, condensing down a lot of things, but uh, just really want to talk about the kingdom. Uh, Mar- I heard Marty Solomon recently on uh, the Bama podcast quote N.T. Wright. N.T. Wright's another guy that wrote a lot about the kingdom. Um, but anyway, what, what, what he said was, and what I am saying to you now is 10% of what I'm going to say is probably wrong, okay? But the problem is, I don't know which parts. <laughs> so, if, uh, if you figure out something that I said today that's wrong, please come and talk to me about it afterwards. Uh, not during the message, but afterwards. Uh, but anyway, so anyway, I want to I share three ideas about the kingdom of God. The first one is the good news of the kingdom. I want to ask you a question. What gospel do you preach? What gospel do you believe? And the unfortunate thing is, in the world that we live in, most churches preach a gospel of personal salvation. That the message of Jesus is all about me being saved and going to heaven when I die. With me, yeah. you know that that's that's kind of what uh that's kind of what we we hear and and what is emphasized in a lot of churches is you know Jesus died for my sins so I can go to heaven when I when I die. But what gospel did Jesus and the apostles preach? So let, I want us just to look, we're going to look at a couple of passages that are representative. Matthew four twenty three to start. Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. So he's, he's proclaiming what kind of good news? The good news of the kingdom. Uh, let's skip over to the end of the book of Acts. Acts chapter 28, verse 30 and 31. Acts 8, 20. Acts 8, uh, sorry, Acts 28, 30 and 31. So for two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. So again, I'm skipping through a lot of stuff, but all through the Gospels, Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God. The apostles, over and over again in the book of Acts, it said they were preaching the kingdom of God. Uh, we don't talk about the kingdom of God very much. So, uh, so I mean, what was the deal? Now, I, I want, there's one, another thing about this passage that the way we heard, the way you just heard it when I read it is very different from what they heard back then. Uh, he says, the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, back in those days, the Lord was a term that specifically referred to the, the ruler of the Roman Empire. Caesar is Lord. And that was actually the declaration you had to make. You know, Caesar is Lord. And that got the Christians in a lot of trouble because they said, Jesus is Lord. And so they were in conflict with the state. But the other word is Christ. 
the word Christ is also a very political term for those people at that time. Christ meant Messiah. It meant the, the, the king who was coming to, uh, to kill all the bad people and, and, and save God's people and lift them up. And th that's what they thought. That's the way they used that term. So these are two terms that were very lo loaded at that time politically. But for us today, they're, they're just religious terms. I mean, when you say Lord, you don't think about the president, do you? You know, there's a great book, by the way, called Jesus for President. But, uh, uh, but I, you know, when you hear the word Christ, you don't think about a conquering king. Uh, you, you think about, you know, the guy that died on the cross. You know, that, right? A am I right? Uh, you, know, you guys with me? So. Uh, but then there's, there's one other passage I want us to look at, and it's back to the beginning of the book of Acts, Acts chapter 1, verse 3. And in this passage, Jesus is still on the earth. It says, after his suffering, talking about Jesus, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about, guess what, the kingdom of God. Now, so I got a personal question for you. Could you do that? Could you get together with a group of people and talk about the kingdom of God for 40 days? You know, it, it, was, it was the centerpiece of what Jesus came to talk about. It's what he was trying to transmit to them, to his disciples. That, that's what he was all about. It's convicting to me, you know. I, I'm not sure I could do that. I wrote three, you know, helped write three books, but, you know, still, I mean, it's 40 days is a long time. So what, what does that word gospel mean anyway? Now, you probably, you know, if you've been around church, you know, gospel means good news, right? Yeah, it's a, it's a term or that... That means good news. But what did gospel mean? What did that word mean in Jesus' day? The, the, the deal is, gospel in the Roman world was the announcement of a new king. That's what it meant in the time of Jesus. Everything indicates that that was the way the New Testament Preachers and writers understood the concept. And there's actually an inscription. It was done about 2 A.D., you know, so, you know, right before, you know, Jesus' adult life. Uh, so, in thi and this is what it says. It's called the Priene Calendar Inscription. Since providence, which has ordered all things and is deeply interested in our life, has set in most perfect order by giving us Augustus, who was the Caesar at the time, you know, the Roman ruler at the time. So, it giving us Augustus, whom she, providence, which is their way of saying the deity, you know, filled him with virtue that he might benefit human kind, sending, um, sending, you know, Caesar Augustus, him at a savior, both for us and for our descendants, that he end war and arrange all things. And since he, Caesar, by his appearance, excelled even our anticipations, passing all previous benefactors and not even leaving, leaving to posterity any hope of surpassing what he has done. So what that just said is, he is the best that there has ever been, and he's the best that there's ever going to be. That's what the inscription says. Okay, so going on. And since the birthday of the God, Augustus, so he's not only Caesar, he's been elevated to God status, was the beginning of the good news, the word gospel. That's the word that's used there. 
he's the beginning of the good news for the world by reason of him. So that's the way the word was understood. You know, a new king has come, and he's going to fix everything. So when the, the writers of the Gospels talk about the Gospel, when they talk about the good news, this is, this is the way people think about it. You know, they're not thinking religious. They're thinking sociopolitical. They're thinking there's a king, a new king has come, and his kingdom is going to fix everything what people heard you with me so that obviously created a confrontation between caesar's empire and the kingdom of jesus and you know for uh, you know for us today oh yeah i mean i don't have a problem with the roman empire you know but our struggle the, the same confrontation exists today. It exists at our time. You know, it's, it's the empire, the world's way of doing things versus the kingdom's way of doing things. That's what it's, it's about. You know, uh, uh, in my country, you know, I, I may have a problem putting God first. In, in my, if, it, if we're talking about my candidate versus your candidate, you know, there's an election coming up, you know, you know, there, there is a confrontation between what God's kingdom is doing and saying and what the world is doing and saying. If it's, if it's my party, if it's my cause, I may have trouble letting go of that and being focused on the kingdom of God. And I think, you know, there's a growing concern. We see disciples get so passionate about the election instead of about the kingdom of God that they, they say horrible things about their brothers and sisters who don't think the same as they do. You know, that's crazy. You know, we're, we're, we, we pledged allegiance to Jesus, you know. We did not pledge allegiance to a country. Now, I think, you know, the fact that Diane and I have lived in a number of different countries, you know, has helped us understand, you know, hey, we're world Christians. I was born in the U.S. I'm grateful for my citizenship. But, you know, that is not loyalty lies. You know, that is not what I'm going to die for. You know, I, my, I'm here... To serve God's kingdom. Diane was, ha was having a, a quiet time this week. And uh, <laughs> most, most every day. <laughs> but uh, so she was reading this passage in Matthew 6, 31 to 33. She was reading it in the New Living Translation. And it, it says something different. Um, that, that really struck her, and she shared it with me, and so now you're getting to hear it. Uh, so, verse 31, so don't worry about these things. What will we eat, or what will we drink, what will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else. So that, that just really struck me. What dominates my thoughts? You know, what am I thinking about all the time? You know, is it the kingdom of God or is it something else? Is it a political party? Is it a candidate? Is it my job? Is, you know, what is it? What dominates my thoughts? And he says, the unbelievers... Their thoughts are dominated by my needs. You know, what am I going to wear? What am I going to eat? What am I going to drink? You know, and, and those, are, those are obviously necessities. But I think in, in the world we live in, our thoughts tend to be dominated not by those things because we take those pretty much for granted. We, our thoughts tend to be dominated by 
my phone or the internet or, you know, what this person said or that person said or, or the game or, you know, you know we, we were going to go eat with Kent last night at a sports bar and I was like, oh, can't do that. And it was packed full of people watching the Tennessee game, which unfortunately didn't end very well. Um, but, uh, but that's another subject. We're not going to let that dominate. <laughs> the deal is, we cannot fulfill the role God gave us if we're bound by commitments that divide us. Now, we are called to show the world what it would be like if God really were king. That, that's, God is he's calling on us to live our lives as if he were king. Of course he is, but, you know, we're supposed to show the world what that looks like. That's our job as disciples. And we can't use the methods of empire in order to advance the kingdom of God. How did the, how did the empire advance? By force, by coercion, by manipulation, by intimidation, by threats. And a lot of us who've been around church a long time have experienced that in church. That is not God's way. That is not God's kingdom. That's using the ways of the world in the church to do what we think needs to be done. And that's not the way God wants it done. You know, one, one of the things that you know, really struck me is thinking about you know, God bringing the children, children of Egypt, children of Israel, sorry, uh, out of Egypt. And, and again, back to the Bema podcast, they, uh, they made this statement. Problem wasn't to get his people out of Egypt. You know, he didn't have a problem. All those miracles, yeah. That was easy. God's problem was to get Egypt out of his people. And again, the same thing is true of us today. It's, it's, it's getting the world out of us. It's getting, you know, the, the things that dominate the thinking of the world out of our thinking and get us focused on God's kingdom. So the second point is the upside down kingdom. So this is based on the idea in Acts 17, 6. When they couldn't find them, they dragged Jason's brothers before the authorities, shouting, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. Now, the, the, the thing about Scripture is, Jesus never gave a definition of the kingdom. He never defined, he never said, this the kingdom is this. You know, here's the easy, you know. What is the kingdom like? That, that's the way he talked about it. He talked about it with illustrations. He talked about it with parables. For example, in, uh, especially in chapter 13 of, the, of Matthew, there's a series of parables. There's parables. You know, the kingdom of God is like this. The kingdom of God is like a guy that sowed seed in the field. It's like a mustard seed. It's like a woman that mixed a large amount of flour with yeast. It's like a hidden treasure in the field. It's like a merchant of pearls. You know, just over and over again, he gave examples. He gave not definitions. And, and the net the lake, the kingdom wanted to settle account, all the way down through chapter 22. You got all these kingdom parables. But the deal is, why did he do that? Why didn't he just say, kingdom of God is X? You know? And I think he did it because he wanted us to. You, know, you got to think. You know, what does that mean? You know, what are, what are all the parables? What, what do they tell me about the kingdom of God? And one of the things I noticed just looking at this list is they're all they're all people doing stuff. So the kingdom it, it's like people doing stuff. You know, it's not just sitting 
around thinking it, it, it takes to be part of God's kingdom. And I, I think the thing that, you know, about all this list is that, that strikes me the most are the, the ones right there in the middle of it, the hidden treasure and the man searching for pearls. You know, both of those, the point of it is the value of God's kingdom. And, you know, like many of you, you know, I've been around a long time. You know, I've suffered from prideful leaders, manipulative leaders, you know, you know, physically challenged by being paralyzed 30 years ago, taken out of the ministry after being in the ministry almost 50 years. You know, Diane had to go back to school, become a nurse, you know. Um, so, I mean, you know, if you, want, if you want to sit down and compare stories, you know, Horror, co compare horror stories. I, I, I'm there for that. You know, we can we can talk, we can talk. Uh, but the deal is, I, I've never wanted to leave. You know, I, I've I've never been tempted with, you know, well, I, I can't say I've never been tempted with giving up. Uh, but you know, I, that, that's just never seriously been a consideration because of the value of the kingdom of God. I mean, I didn't sign on to follow people. I signed on to follow Jesus. And yeah, sometimes along the way, you know, it, it was a lot, like easier to follow people than it was to follow Jesus. You know, and you, maybe you can relate to that. But, uh, but the thing is, that's not why I'm here. I, I'm here because I'm trying to follow Jesus. That's what it's about. And I don't do it good I don't do it right, and I mess up, you know, I hope, probably like all of us, you know, that's just, you know, we're people. But the thing about it is when Jesus came and talked about the kingdom, preached the kingdom, his idea was not to change how you think about the kingdom. His, his, his idea was to change how you live the kingdom. Fact, that, the idea in action. And, and to me, one of the most incredible pieces of literature on the kingdom of God is the Sermon on the Mount. And the second book that we wrote was based on the Sermon on the Mount. I like to call it the Sermon on the Kingdom because to me that's about what he's doing in that sermon is he is telling us an alternative way to live in the world. You know, a way to live that's different from the way the rest of the world lived. And, uh, and then the rest of his life, you know, after that point, the rest of his life, he tried to show how to form an alternative community, working with first his group of 12 and then expanding. But he was showing them how to take that alternative lifestyle and make community out of it. And that's what we're doing. That's what church is. An alternative way to live, the world lives. You know, it's it's not trying to be like the world. It's totally the heart of the to me is Matthew six, the Lord's prayer, and the heart. verse ten, your kingdom come. You know, your will be done. Those are parallel, so that you know, they basically. What that means is they mean the same thing. Your kingdom come, your will be done. But how? On earth as it is in heaven. So, uh, so God wants you to start living now. You're going to live in heaven. Okay? That, that, and so that's, that's in the future, right? Nobody's in heaven yet here, right? We haven't lost anybody yet. <laughs> and so we're, that's in the future. So we titled, the subtitle of our first book on the kingdom was The Future Breaks In. So the idea is the future, since we're supposed to be living like we're going to live in heaven, so we're living like the future. So I've got another picture up here for you. 
So, as Christians, we are aliens who've come from the future to show people how to live now. It may not look like that, you know. Although there's a show on Netflix now called Alien, the, the resident alien about a guy that, anyway. I haven't watched it, but. I'm. So, so you, you get what I'm saying? You know, we're, we're living a lifestyle that's different because it's from the future. Because it's the way heaven is, and that's what God wants us, that's what God wants now. And so, if we live like that now, we're going to create a community of people that are different from the world, and that's going to attract people and repel people. Just like it did in Jesus' day. It created a violent reaction. People loved it, and people hated it. Because it was different. We fall so easily into wanting to be as much like the world as possible you know, to avoid criticism instead of as much like Jesus as possible. And, and come what may. So, so again, so the church is a group of people that are aliens. You know, you're, you're strange beings from the future, you know, who are... Uh, living in the here and now. So the church then is a colony uh, of people living like that. Now, I got a couple of examples of that. One of them is uh, not too far from here, up near Lexington, Kentucky, there's uh, Boonesboro, where Dan Boone built this fort. This is a picture of what it supposedly looked like back then. They've actually reconstructed the thing, and I mean, it's incredible. You know, the, the whole, they've reconstructed the whole stockade and everything. It's really, really cool to go visit. But, uh, but the idea, these guys, they, they carved out this place in the middle of the wilderness, and they built this fort as the beginning point of taking over that part of the country. Now, they had a lot of opposition, you know, from the Native Americans that weren't real happy about them taking over their hunting grounds. But, uh, but it was a colony of people that was invading an area and so that's what the church is so we are a colony of people you know here and now with a different lifestyle trying to not kill the native inhabitants but share the message with them so another example from d-day uh, again on D-Day, they go in and on the beach. They immediately establish a beachhead where they, they bring in their supplies. And, and from there, they branch out to, to, to advance across the mainland. But that, again, that's the church's, it, it's like a beachhead. You know, we're, we're, the, we're, the, we're the invading force from the future, you know, trying to impact the world around us, an alternative way of life, an alternative uh, community. The third point about the kingdom is it's a cruciform kingdom. You know, at the summit in Orlando, there was a class uh, taught by A.T. Arneson and Raphael Lua, and it was entitled Cruciform Leadership, and I was like, what is that? I had, I literally, I had to look the word up. You know, what is that? What does cruciform mean? Well, it's pretty simple. It just means in the shape of a cross. But uh, anyway, in that class, the one of the little, they gave away a little gift. Uh, they gave everybody in the class a little wooden cross. And uh, I've carried it with me ever since just to remind me that I'm trying to follow Jesus. Um, that I'm trying to live a cruciform life, a, a cross-shaped life. Uh, I don't succeed at that often, but uh, it, it's, it's in my pocket to remind me that uh, that's what I'm trying to do. You know, and the thing about it is, change is difficult. Anybody agree to that? Yeah. yeah. You know, lose weight, you know, uh, uh, whatever other thing you want to try. Change is difficult. 
We get used to our rhythms, our customs. So making radical change is not easy. It requires intentionality. You know, it requires effort. It requires thought. It requires discipline. It requires patience, practice. I love this quote from uh, John Howard Yoder, The Politics of Jesus, about Jesus. Because the thing is, to sacrifice is to be like Jesus. So what Yoder wrote is, here on the cross is the man who loves his enemies. The man whose justice is greater than that of the Pharisees who, being rich, became poor, who gives his shirt to those who took his cloak, who prays for those who treat him with contempt. The cross is not a detour or an obstacle. On the it is not even the way to the kingdom. It is the kingdom come. The cross is the kingdom come. Jesus gave his life for us so we could give our lives for him and his kingdom. I, the idea of you know, Jesus giving his life for us, I just didn't realize how often that was repeated in, in the Bible. But it, it's, it's repeated a lot. I mean, Kent shared with us you know, Galatians 2.20 today, a passage that I've shared with the church here before in the past as well. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me but I now live in the body I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me so Jesus loved me I talked about gave himself for me so Paul says I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live Amen. that is hard for me to say I mean, I just read it, but it's hard for me to say and, and, and actually believe it. You know, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live. It, it doesn't feel like that. You know what I mean? It feels like Steve's still here. It feels like Steve's still living. It feels like Steve's still acting. But what Paul said is, I was crucified, gone. Jesus took over my body. I mean, that. But the key is what he goes on to say. He said, I live by faith in the Son of God. It's, it's not because I know what a great person I am and I know how much like Jesus I am. It's not about that. It's because I believe in Jesus and I trust in Him. If I trust in Him, then the, that can come true in my life. Not because of how great I am or how good I follow in his steps, but because he's working in my life. It's by faith. You know, it's not by works. And that gives me some comfort. 1 John 3.16, another great passage. Not John 3.16, when, you know, they hold up at the football games. Uh, John, 1 John 3.16. This is how we know what love is that Jesus Christ gave his life for us, so we must also give our lives for our brothers. So again, it goes back to Jesus' example. He gave himself up for us to give us an example that we should give up our life for each other. How hard is it for you to get together during the week with a brother or sister and pray together? I mean, he, he said, give up your life for them. And yet, a lot of times, we struggle with giving up a little bit of time. You know? But the incredible thing about all this is it ain't over yet. Because of what it says in Hebrews 12, 28 and 29. 
Hebrews 12, 28, 29. Since we're receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be grateful. Inspired by this gratitude, let us worship God as He pleases with reverent fear for our God is a consuming fire. He says, since we are receiving a kingdom, we don't have it yet. It's a process. We are receiving it. And that gives me hope. You know, it ain't over yet. He's still working on us. You know, we're still growing. We're still becoming more like Him. We can still repent. We can still change because we're receiving a kingdom. And, we, and it's, it's a gift. We're receiving it. He is giving it to us. We receive it. But the other thing this passage says is that it is an unshakable kingdom. Those of you who have seen the church shaken, you've experienced shaking. You know, and uh, many of us have experienced shaking in our marriages. Uh, maybe shaking in our families. But the kingdom of God cannot be shaken. You know, it cannot be. That's what it says. It can. Now, the church can be shaken. And God, a lot of times, He lets that happen. You know. Just to kind of filter out the bad stuff, you know. And you know, he, 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 you know. We go through those times. You know, that's part of, that's part of the process, you know. You know, your marriage can be shaken. Your life can be shaken. Your family can be shaken. Again, because God is working to make you more like Jesus. The challenge for us is to, is to keep on receiving the kingdom. To keep on learning about the kingdom. To keep on growing. To keep on becoming more and more like Jesus. To to understand more and more what it means to, to live an alternative lifestyle. You know, to keep learning, to keep growing. Again, back to what Tom said, those words, stay open to what God is doing. Stay open. Let's, uh, let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, May your name be holy. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we've also forgiven those who've sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.